our, um, our North American Bears Expert Team webinar series. Uh, Rich and I, as the co-chairs, appreciate your continued involvement in the um, in the NABIT issues, and um, and we invite and welcome other BSG members from other expert teams to participate in this webinar. Um, and for and we appreciate Dave Garcellis and Mike Proctor for leading the Bear Specialist Group. We don't get a chance to say it later. We want to wish everyone out there a happy holiday and a happy new year for those who celebrate that. And we want to remind folks that our webinars are recorded and preserved online. Today's panel discussion will also be placed on our recorded uh, webinar location. And um, uh, that um, will be available for viewing at any time. This will be the seventh webinar for the North American Bears Expert Team in 2021. Uh, and the group has contributed six IBN articles. And we have a lot more planned for 2022. Uh, we have an IBN submission deadline approaching, so please keep your holidays in mind and know that we must work through the holidays if you haven't done your work already. Uh, a few more IBN articles are expected by um, six to seven uh, NABIT team members, and our deadline for those is January 15th of 2022. Um, they need to be sent to uh, Rich and I. That way we can review the articles, get them um, ready to go and send them to Dave for his final review before they're submitted to the IBM. For today's webinar, as always, we'll finish within an hour to respect everybody's time. And don't forget, you can use the chat functions to ask questions at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I just want to remind everyone. Okay, I thought she was trying to get on the team's previous one. Okay, you're online there, Wayne. You're on, so please mute yourself. Um, just want to remind everyone that our speakers must mute their microphones and turn off their cameras to preserve our bandwidth. Uh, so let's get started with today's webinar, uh, certainly a relevant topic and one that we've been hearing a lot about. The panel, our today's um, webinar is grizzly bear population expansion in the Yellowstone ecosystem, methods to document expansion and ramifications of a conservation success by Dan Bjornley of Wyoming Game and Fish and Mark Harrelson of the USGS. Take it away, gentlemen. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, you guys see the screen now? Yep. Okay, good. Um, yes, so. Our topic today, we're going to try to uh, hopefully enlighten folks on some of the uh, issues regarding the GYE grizzly bear population, greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, this is work that you know we've been conducting probably as far as uh, documenting range expansion since oh, 2000, early 2000s for sure. Um, and Chuck Schwartz did some of the first work in the 2000s on that, but uh, we tried to come up with some of the, uh, some methods that were a little bit more uh, uh, timely and easier to, easier to conduct than, than some of the methods that Chuck was using. And so um, we, uh, we will try to at least discuss some of those that right now. So, this is the uh, GYE grizzly bear population. It's the southernmost grizzly bear population in North America. Um, the, you know, it's currently still isolated, but expanding. And uh, you know, once a contiguous population all the way from Northern Alaska down into Mexico, but uh, now currently the, the GYE population centered here in uh, Northwest Wyoming and Southern Montana, Eastern Idaho is, is now the southernmost population in the lower 48. Here is a, uh, a figure that just shows the, um, the five, six, I guess, ecosystem recovery zones and the GYE population kind of in that Southeast corner. Um, this population, our new estimate now is about a thousand, a little over a thousand bears for the greater Yellowstone population. The Northern Continental Divide has approximately the same. Um, cabinet yaks and Sel Selkirk populations are adjacent to Canada as well. And those are, are much smaller with around 50 to 100 bears 
in those two populations. And then the North Cascades and the Bitterroots are effectively um, not occupied right now. We've had a few bears roaming down into the Bitterroots from probably, well, one from the Cabinet Yak and potentially um, wandering around in, in that area. But really, those two populations are essentially unoccupied right now. And so that kind of gives you the, the layout of, of where this population, where these populations exist right now and uh, potentials for connectivity we'll discuss in uh, a few slides here. But overall, the, the history of this population real quickly is that uh, it's changes in management philosophies during the late 1960s to a more of a natural regulation in Yellowstone National Park led to uh, dump closures, which were you know, a big food source for a lot of bears, as you can see in these pictures here. And uh, that abrupt closure led to significant amount of, of conflicts and mortalities for the grizzly bear population. And it's uh, around, at a minimum of 229 grizzly bears died from 1967 to 1972 due to these type of mortalities related to conflicts and, and dump closures, which of course dramatically reduced that population to the point where in uh, 1973, the formation of the interagency grizzly bear study team happened and the last legal hunting of bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem occurred in 1974. And then in 1975, the greater Yellowstone grizzly population was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So at the time they were listed, the population existed primarily in Yellowstone National Park and adjacent areas, which is outlined here mostly Northwest Wyoming and a little bit in Montana and Idaho. Um, population numbers were almost certainly less than 250 bears and the negative and the population trajectory was still negative and would remain that way until uh, probably into the mid uh, early 1980s. And so just to give folks a little bit of a, uh, idea of what we have as far as size of this population the in the areas that this population exists in um, national park lands in the GYE constitute over 10,000 square kilometers of land that's Yellowstone National Park to the north as well as uh, Grand Teton on the very south and then a small chunk of of uh, John D Rockefeller Parkway that connects the two right in the middle there and the blue line is the recovery zone uh, or primary conservation area that it has designated in, in the recovery plan. And that's 23,828 square kilometers. So a uh, much larger area, but still just the kind of that core of, of wilderness areas and um, protected lands around Yellowstone Park. And then, this light shaded area here, that uh, we term the demographic monitoring area. And that nearly 50,000 square kilometers, that includes the area that bears our populations are monitored and mortalities are uh, counted toward mortality thresholds for the population. So this is kind of the area where um, management is, is the most active, I guess. And, um, Outside of that, this habitat is, is deemed less suitable for continued occupancy of grizzly bears. Um, not that anyone's stopping bears from moving outside, as you will see in a few slides, but, um, but that it's, it's deemed better and more suitable habitat overall. So, you know, the question comes is why do we uh, need to estimate range extent? For this population and you know there's a lot of different um, reasons for for uh for estimating range extent um number one is for a listed population like the greater yellowstone grizzly bear population we need to 
be able to apply protections in the appropriate areas and not only where bears exist and making sure that they're afforded the protections uh, required under the ESA, but also not extending those required ESA reviews beyond areas where bears currently exist into uh, places that may uh, unnecessarily require that type of um, ESA review and oversight. Um, also just informing many different kinds of um, conservation and management decisions that may happen um, in and around this population area, such as uh, human dominated landscapes, uh, you know, developed areas within the occupied range of grizzly bears and knowing what kind of bear resistant and bear compliant type of uh, management decisions might be necessary. And then also just to inform the public generally where they may encounter grizzly bears. Now I get calls very regularly from hunters and anglers all around North America, all around the world that call and say, I'm going hunting or fishing somewhere in this area or going on a backpack trip in the Wind River Mountains or up in the uh, Teton Range and where may I expect to see a grizzly bear? Am I gonna run into a bear there? And some people that, that makes a decision as to whether or not they actually wanna go there. Some of them are seeking it out because they wanna see bears and others are, they don't want any part of actually hiking around in areas where they, they might run into a grizzly bear. So just that kind of information right there is, is actually been quite important to uh, informing people on, on where we might find grizzly bears. So there've been previous efforts to do this type of uh, monitoring of the range extent. The first was done by uh, Basile in the early 1980s. That just used verified observations, some telemetry work from the early telemetry that was done, um, data from 1973 to 79 and plotted on a, on a larger and more coarse scale than, than the scale that we use here, but 10 kilometer um, grid cell size. And so, and actually, so that would be 10 on a side, a hundred square kilometer grid. Um, so it was, it was a lot more coarse than, than what we do now, but there were a lot, there was a lot less data to, to work with for sure. And then in the early 1990s, Blanchard repeated some of that work on a method similar to Basile with the same type of a grid uh, using data from the 1980s. And there hadn't really been much documented change at that time. And then in the early 2000s, Chuck Schwartz changed it up and did a different method where he did individual kernel home range, fixed kernel home ranges of, of collared and radio telemetry from individuals, but then also overlapped um, things like some mortalities and conflicts and things like that and made fixed kernels of those as well, even though they were not from the same individuals and just took those points and kind of overlaid it into, a, uh, into one contiguous fixed kernel polygon. It didn't use all verified observations though. So if we had say tracks or something like that from farther out in the extent of the range, um, those are not used. So, and Chris may not remember this, but um, there was a meeting quite a long time ago where uh, we talked about having an idea of where you might find grizzly bears. And one of the ideas Chris came up with was, if we had a dead cow on the ground all over the ecosystem, where would you expect a grizzly bear to find that cow? And that kind of led us to trying to figure out if there was a better way to, to document and outline that range extent more closely so that we're not overshooting because that, that fixed kernel uh, technique that, that Chuck Schwartz used did tend to overshoot the range extent a bit. And, and so we ended up with some areas that were deemed occupied that probably weren't, or at least not at a density enough to, to say that we had a dead cow on the ground, a cow or a bear would find it. And so, so what we did is we came up with a, a different method where we used 
um, all verified grizzly bear location data. And that means telemetry, that means captures, mortalities, conflicts, but also things like DNA hair snares that somebody may have conducted in one corner of the ecosystem, verified observations, tracks, anything that we could, we could definitely verify, yes, that was a grizzly bear. You know, trail cam photos are a big thing now and we, we get a lot of those. And so take all of those, throw them on a three kilometer by three kilometer grid, and we chose that size because of a uh, mean daily activity radius of one and a half kilometers that we found for male grizzly bears in some work that Chuck Schwartz did back in 2010. So we use that as kind of a good starting point for our population and put all the points on that and then used uh, zonal analysis, which is a, a nearest neighbor type of analysis in GIS and ordinary Krieging to develop a predicted surface of that grizzly bear distribution. And so we can define the outer perimeter of that occupied range without overestimating as much as, as we may with a fixed kernel. And so we, uh, we only use verified reported occurrences though. And so we're not using anything that someone calls us up and said, hey, I saw a brown bear and I'm sure it was a grizzly bear and it was over in the Bighorn Mountains. We look at a lot of those with, with skepticism until we can get some sort of uh, unanimous verification from a panel of, of folks from around the area and, and around North America actually will send the photos of the tracks or a bear or other evidence and uh, hair samples that we may get will be sent into a lab for DNA analysis. And if we can get that confirmation from the panel or from the DNA, then we'll include that. <clears throat> and so here are a couple examples. This photo on the left here is one from just this past May down at the uh, southern end of the uh, Wyoming range, which is kind of on the western border uh, south of Jackson, like almost down to, uh, down to where Utah starts on the Wyoming border, actually. And it's only, I think, 30, 35 kilometers from the Utah border. And then on the right here, you know, just a typical grizzly bear track that we'll find, you know, folks will send us in and pictures and we'll send those out and make sure that we uh, get some confirmation on that. And if so, they go into the pile of all the other locations that we have. So here's an example of of what our grid would look like. These are three kilometer by three kilometer cells. We'll take all our data points. In this case, this is data from 1976 to 1990. And that's another important point here is that on each individual year, you know, we're collecting data from different parts of the ecosystem where we may be trapping and collaring bears and we don't cover the entire ecosystem annually. And so to just use one year's worth of data would give us a really small snapshot of, of what things look like. So we have to pool the data. And so we considered a range of, of years, settled on 15 years is kind of a good uh, range where we we have good coverage of, of the entire ecosystem, but it's not so large that we miss things. Um, if if oc occupied range starts to change at the core, uh, we may not catch that if we just use the entire block of time. So we use a 15 year moving window. So we'll start here at 1976 to 90, and then we'll go 77 to 91 and so on and so on through. So a 15 year window, We'll throw all the points up there and then just say, okay, which cells have a point, anything one or greater. So it doesn't matter if there's a thousand points in that cell or just one, it gets a, that point gets a value of a one. And then we'll do the zonal analysis, just a nearest neighbor analysis, which goes around each individual point and it's eight nearest adjacent neighbors and and says which ones are occupied. And then all of those get a one or a zero. We'll sum it up to a value then of zero to nine for each of those cells. And then we do a Krieging, uh, ordinary Krieging to get 
a prediction surface of where grizzly bears may be. And so each of these colors is basically a value that outer perimeter is one, and then two, three, four, and all the way up through nine is that uh, darkest red in that far northeast corner right there. So this would be then the occupied range for 1990. And then we will move on 77 to 91 would give us that occupied range for 1991. And so if we put, we just take the outer perimeter of that, we don't really report the different densities within that because some of that can be biased just by effort and how many collars we may have. If there's a project going on in the Northern Range of Yellowstone and a ton of collars get put in there at one time, that's going to influence what the density may look like. But the overall occupancy is still pretty valid within that outer perimeter. So here we have a little animation of what our range expansion looks like now from 1990 to 2020 in 15-year windows. Um, it starts out at 23,000 square kilometers. And by 2020, that occupied range is over 70,000 square kilometers. So it's about a 202% increase over that time. And you can see how the, not only the recovery zone is filling up now where it started in 1990, just kind of in the recovery zone area, but now is filling up the DMA and extending down the Wyoming or the Wind River Range to the Southeast there toward Lander. And now all the way up to Bozeman as well in the Northwest. And then all of these little bear symbols, those are actually verified locations of outliers that are outside of the predicted surface. So this is kind of the example of, of Chris's dead cow idea, which is the green shaded area would be kind of that place where if you had a cow on the ground, you might accept, expect a grizzly bear to find that cow. These outer areas, we still have a few grizzly bears out there. And so those are occasional occurrences, but they're not occupied range. And so those places um, are probably that, that next area, you know, as we move on through 2021 and 22, the places where we see those bear symbols are going to be the places where that green shading continues to expand outward. And we'll do this one more time, but this time, oops, let me try that again here. We'll uh, do this one more time, but this time we're going to do it in conjunction with the population, just to show this is kind of how, how that tracks with our population estimate. This is a population estimate we have with the integrated population model from 1983 to 2020. And you can see, you know, we're getting that continu continuous population growth and that population expansion uh, at the same time. And so uh, it's those tracking pretty solidly. We're not seeing things where the population is flatlining, but we're still seeing that expansion moving outward beyond. <clears throat> Mark, you got anything to add in this color commentator guy? Is there any? Well, um, if you can circle this, the middle part of that integrated population numbers, we did have a period where we we suspected we had slowing of growth. Mm -hmm. Right in there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, it did slow a little bit right in there as as things kind of tipped around the early two thousands, but fairly steady and probably more steady than than we originally predicted maybe a few years ago before we had some of the uh, newer methods that we're using here. <clears throat> and so um, to just kind of compare um, the two methods, this is a slide that Mark put together that has the, uh, the kernel, the fixed kernel from just mortalities now and, and not any of the other location types, just to show how 
that fixed kernel time tends to overestimate a bit compared to Krieging. The Krieging range estimate is for all locations of all types. And these are for the same 10 year periods now, not the 15 years for a direct comparison. And you know, shows that generally, especially early on when, when those data were more sparse, you know, as anyone who's used kernels before, the less dense your data, the more it tends to overestimate actually. And so um, we get that a little bit more expansion on the outside predicted by kernels than we do by this Krieging as we get farther on into uh, higher density data sources, we get a little bit less of that. But this figure here kind of shows shows those two methods and uh, quantitatively shows that they track very well. The correlation is, is 98%. So we're seeing the same trends. We're just seeing a little bit less overestimation by, by using that Krieging method. <clears throat> and those, those male or, or those mortality sources were chosen as kind of a, a way to be a little bit less biased. Our, um, mortality sources for uh there it's not it's not a product of effort i guess is what i'm trying to say the the mortalities are just where bears end up and so that gives us a little bit less biased look at what uh what that range extent would be comparing that to the to the krieging and you know as we expect when you look at some of these outliers that expansion is driven by males, you know, especially the subadult males that tend to range widely and, and disperse out from their natal home ranges. And so, so we've got a lot of these, these yellow squares here, these are all males outside of the uh, occupied range. And this occupied range is from 2004. And so the 2005 to 2014 locations outside that are just give, shown here as an example of how that contributes to that that expansion overall and moves the moves that occupied range outward and of course females we uh we would expect to see a little bit less of that and so we actually did just female only and so this would be known mortalities known collared bears you know, conflicts where we knew the identity of the bear, um, verified locations where it was a family group where we knew there was a female there, but lone individuals with unknown sex are not included in any of this. And so we'll do the same thing here just to show quickly what that, that female expansion looks like. And this gives us a kind of a better idea of, um, I guess for lack of a better term, the realized niche of, of grizzly bears in the GYE. This is where demographic occupancy occurs. And we have, um, and what we do notice, notice is that when we do reach um, female expansion into certain areas, that's where we tend to have things like bigger increases in the use of army cutworm moth sites in this area or, um, conflicts in this upper green area down here with cattle allotments is, you know, we'll get those sporadic incidences and, and observations, but once the female distribution shows up, that's when we really see that, that bigger expansion and, and uh, of observations. And so we've got a population recovery that has demonstrated a positive trajectory since you know, the mid 1980s, we've got evidence for density dependent effects from work that Frank Van Manen and others did back in 2016, especially um, density dependent, dependent effects on, on vital rates, juvenile survival specifically has been reduced and that slowing that Mark had mentioned. Uh, current population estimate of over a thousand bears now within the demographic monitoring area and sustainable mortality within that demographic monitoring area that allows that trajectory to continue upward. We've got increases in effective population size, low inbreeding, and we've also got occupied range that we just showed here that kind of 
demonstrates that while we're still, you know, it's a still isolated population, the uh, potential for natural connectivity has increased. And, and uh, this slide here will kind of show what we're talking about and how, how much that has increased. Um, what we have here is, is the occupied range crosshatch for the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but also the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, which was also done with a, a slightly modified version of the Krieging method by uh, Lori Roberts and Cecily Costello from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And so uh, this yellow line right here is the recovery zone for the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. This is the Bitterroot ecosystem recovery zone right here. And these light blue shaded areas are what the Fish and Wildlife Service has kind of designated as a maybe present area. And that takes into account a lot of those outliers that we talked about uh, just previously that um, are kind of scattered around, especially in this zone here, but also along the fringes of, of that occupied range using hydrological um, units. And so, if we look at the distance between that occupied range right now is around 60 kilometers, which is not too far. Of course, we do have interstate highways, Interstate 90 between the NCDE and the GYE here, and also Interstate 15 along the western side of the GYE that could act as a barrier to that uh, connectivity. Um, there are places, mountain ranges and things like that where connectivity could occur. And actually, uh, in 2017, Peck and others looked at some of the potential pathways for connectivity between those two ecosystems. And, you know, there are, all of these are considered pathways. The darker areas are the more constricted and constrained pathways where a lot of, uh, of predicted paths overlap right here, but we also have some of that along the mountain ranges to the west and going up into the Beaverhead Mountains on the Idaho-Montana border as well. And so if you do look at where some of those outliers are occurring, it is in these pathways right here, especially um, to the west and uh, north of, of the GYE. And so that potential for connectivity, although it hasn't occurred, is is definitely uh, is is getting closer. But as we have this population recovery and range expansion, there are some, I guess, consequences for a, for lack of a better term, of that population recovery. You know, considering where we were in the early '80s, it's it's a good problem to have. We have a population that's doing well, but we do have increased conflicts and mortalities in areas, especially as bears expand into uh, more human dominated areas outside the recovery zone and the demographic monitoring area. And bears expand into the, some of these places where it's not as easy to provide them protection and, and priority protection that it is when they're inside those uh, more public land, protected public land areas. We don't have management authority over a lot of the private lands where, where bears occur as they move out. So this shows the percentage, the total area of grizzly bear occupied range through 2020, but also the percent of that area that's outside the demographic monitoring area right now. And you know, from 1990, where it was virtually zero, up to over 30% of the occupied range is now outside the demographic monitoring area, which was designated as the more suitable habitat for grizzly bears in the GYE. And if you look at the uh, proportion or the area of that, which is public land, we're over 12,000 square kilometers of public land now out of that total of 70,000 plus. And private just land. for, uh, private sorry, land. <laughs> private land, sorry. Thanks, Mark. Uh, 12,000 square kilometers of private land compared to that total of, of 70,000 in occupied range. And just for some perspective, the total area of Yellowstone, Grand Teton National Parks and the JDR Parkway 
combined is 10,000, over 10,000 square kilometers. So there's more uh, occupied range private land now than there is of the national park system in the greater Yellowstone. <clears throat> So hopefully this works here, but this is kind of a, uh, this is a figure to show what some of these lands look like. And I'm sure for our folks who might be on the east front of, of the NCDE population, you're running into a, a similar things there where bears are moving out into places where they haven't been seen in a really, really long time. And we're, we're running into that similar thing in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so here, just to orient you, this is Yellowstone Park right here, Cody, Wyoming right here, Tetons and, and Jackson down here. And let's see if I can get this to go. We'll zoom in on one of the locations that we had a couple of years ago. And it's just outside of this little town of Byron, Wyoming right here, it's in these ag areas, but this is an extremely arid landscape overall with irrigated fields along the river bottoms. And the grizzly bears tend to move along the river, of course, when they're expanding outward. This was actually a female a family group that wandered out here and ended up getting captured. And so, but this is the kind of landscape that, that bears are moving into as they expand outward. This is uh, from the uh, miracle of Google Earth. We can look at what this country looks like from street view and pan around to see that, you know, it's this pretty flat ag dominated country. The Absorca Mountains to the west, which is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they're approximately 60 kilometers out from that. And this is the same view now looking right now looking north, but then panning to the east. And the Bighorn Mountains to the east are approximately 40 kilometers. So they're at, this location is actually closer to the Bighorns now than it is to the occupied range within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. <clears throat> and as bears move out into these more human dominated landscapes where we have things like, um, you know, these, farm grain bins and, and cornfields, bears will get into that, of course, and, and livestock feed and things like that. The likelihood of mortalities and conflicts definitely increases. And also the increased risk of kind of unique sources of human dominated or human caused mortality. And so this here is a photo of the Heart Mountain Canal, which runs actually just west more toward the greater Yellowstone ecosystem than that Byron location that I just showed, but is a, especially in spring and early summer, a very high flow irrigation canal system. And as bears and other wildlife, as well as livestock and, and other things get caught in this, it's really, really hard for them to get out due to the high flow. And then also that uh, the sides of this are all, are all cement and goes into more of an overflow tube as it flows down into different parts for irrigation. So since 2016, there've been seven documented grizzly mortalities just in this Heart Mountain Canal right here as they get in and just can't get out. And there's uh, photos of the claws from one of the bears that died drowned in that canal and you know clawing to try to get its way out of the canal. So as bears move into these dominated, human dominated landscapes, it's, it's just so many different sources of mortality that they're not likely to encounter in that more protected area within the GYE. And we see that overall as we look at the different zones and the and the number of conflicts over the years from 92 to 2019 different conflicts by zone if you look at inside the recovery zone it's pretty flat as you get into the demographic monitoring area of course it increases as bears have increased their occupied range within the dma but then outside the dma since about 2010 that's also jumped quite a bit <clears throat> 
mortalities show that same trend over time. This is independent age bears two plus um, by land ownership within the different zones. So this is the recovery zone. Um, public land mostly within the recovery zone with a little bit of increase in private, but there just isn't that much private land in the recovery zone. Within the DMA, it's still pretty much a public land dominated area. And we see more of those mortalities starting to occur right around 2000. And, but then outside the DMA around 2010 or so is when we really see those mortalities sources occur there. And the bulk of those are obviously going to be more private land dominated as they move into areas that are shifting into away from public land <clears throat> and the uh, also that same type of zone of co human caused mort or documented mortalities for independent age bears by a different cause within the recovery zone DMA and then outside the DMA. Um, like most grizzly bear populations in North America or anywhere, human caused mortalities are the highest source of mortality regardless of where they are but if you look at within the recovery zone that uh, that source is is not completely a hundred percent we still get undetermined we get natural mortalities and the timing of those has been pretty consistent in the in the amount of those has been consistent over time whereas again with outside the recovery zone in the dma Starting around 2000, those have begun to increase, dominated by human caused mortality here as well. But then outside the DMA, pretty much all human caused mortalities uh, starting around 2010. So, in response to increases in mortality, uh, a mortality review was conducted in 2020 that provided some recommendations for reducing bear human conflicts and grizzly bear mortalities in the GYE. A report was uh, produced at the time. And there are a few recommendations regarding backcountry recreation and hunting and, and practices that could be changed there, uh, uh, as well as reducing front country conflicts and mortalities, uh, livestock conflicts, and some community outreach things like bear wise and bear smart communities and um, trash cans and, and whatever we can do to, to provide more bear resistant food storage and, and garbage handling practices around the ecosystem. <clears throat> and so as we look at future considerations, one thing that has to be considered is just the uh, changes in land use, especially in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Although only 7% of the DMA is private land, um, as bears move into that private land, and that changes from more of a open land, um, ag dominated to more residential developments and, and dense, highly dense, densely populated areas. You know, the population of, of Bozeman and the surrounding areas is just exploding and that's trickling around the entire ecosystem. Um, all of these communities around here, especially in the last couple of years, have been seeing that explosion, uh, COVID driven or, or whatever. And in addition to that, we're seeing a lot of recreational use coming and Yellowstone is 4 million visitors a year now. And so, as this area starts to see that increase where we're, we're seeing changes of over 50% in, in a lot of the, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem here um, in residential development, bears moving into that country are going to find it a little bit harder to, to exist without running into some sorts of conflicts. <clears throat> And also uh, climate change. We really, this is a uh, figure that was uh, produced by the Yellowstone Climate Assessment uh, product of USGS and Montana State and other collaborators and showing um, 
an estimated increases in population in the greater Yellowstone area of, of five to six degrees Fahrenheit by, by 2040 and 10 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. And so with those kinds of increases um, also predicted is, is an actual increase, potential increase in precipitation, but much more of that precip would happen as rainfall and not snowfall. And so the potential changes and the effects of that on, on population expansion, food resources, things like that is, is just unknown right now. And so with that, those kinds of um, impacts, we, we have to have a little bit of flexibility into understanding what, uh, what may happen with, with the population growth as it continues um, outward into uh, many of these, these areas that haven't seen grizzly bears in, you know, some, in some of these places over a hundred years. Um, yeah, I just mentioned that, you know, with the potential effects of uh, climate change mm -hmm. or whether that's going to accelerate expansion or cause a contraction. Um, right. Yeah. As yeah. foods, foods are going to change. What's available to the bears are, is going to change. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, we'd like to thank the uh, interagency grizzly bear study team, all the different members here from the uh, member agencies, state, federal, and tribal. And happy holidays to everyone. And, uh, we welcome any questions folks might have. Sterling has a hand raised. Yeah, as always, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan and Mark, for an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always impressed by the work that's done by your team. Um, I have a question about, you said that the sustainable mortality rates in the demographic uh, monitoring area were uh, sustainable. Uh, part of my question is, how do you calculate that? And it, and the second part is, if the um, is is it sustainable in the area between the end edge of the uh, recovery area and the outer edge of the demographic monitoring area? And is it based on females or males or some kind of combined calculation of sustainable harvest rate? Mark, you want to take that one or you want? Yeah, there's many parts to that question. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we estimate sustainable mortality from our vital rates. And, you know, as the last iteration we did, uh, female survivorship was, you know, 94, 95, something like that, where um, we estimate that, you know, we could go down to, uh, 93 and still have a, a growing population if all the other vital rates, um, uh, stayed the same. Um, we realized that, that most of our data for our vital rates comes from, uh, captured bears that are captured and monitored within the recovery zone but we do have a lot of those captured bears that also use portions of the uh, demographic monitoring area. So we, we, we feel like we've got a representative sample for a, a good portion of the um, demographic monitoring area. Where we're really lacking is in the Southern parts. We don't have a lot of marks in the Wind Rivers, for example, or some of those areas. Um, so we feel like we got a good handle on on uh, vital rates that we can assess um, sustainable mortality from. And, and when we document mortalities, like say for independent age um, bears, we have an estimator where we try to estimate the unknown, unknown unreported um, mortality. And we combine that to get a total mortality estimate and assess where we stand relative to our vital rates. Um, Dan showed that one slide that you know we're moving into this integrated population model, and that 
we're just beginning to explore how we can use that to assess what sustainable mortality is. Um, and that will give us a little more flexibility for uh, gaming additional mortality in that, in that setting. Um, so I, I think we have a good handle on what's going on in the DMA, but we don't outside the DMA. We don't, we don't have any uh, uh, research monitoring outside the DMA. All the captured bears out there are primarily conflict bears. Um, and we know they have a lower survival rate than, than bears that are captured initially in the, in the research sample. <clears throat> you want to add anything, Dan? No, I guess, I, you know, just overall our, our thresholds have, I don't remember, you would have a better idea of when and how often we've met any mortality thresholds on, under that, uh, the overall demographic monitoring area for males and females, but it, with our new estimate, I'm sure it's hasn't been for for a while now. Well, we had a couple of really bad years, 2012 mm -hmm. and was it 2017 or 18? Yeah, I, I can't where remember. There have exceeded, been a couple. Yeah, where we exceeded the mortality thresholds that were in place then. But on average, since 2002, even with a conservative um, population estimate, we, we have been under what we would consider sustainable. Okay, there's another question from Garth. Garth, are you there? Yeah, I am, Chris. Thanks. Uh, Dan, I'm wondering if you've um, done any land use planning. Like, have you gone out to the public and said, where do you want bears and where do you not want bears? And where we don't want bears, we're going to treat uh, problem bears differently because we, based on public input, we're, we, we're gonna exclude them from this area or something like that. Have you, have you done that sort of a public, have you turned this thing around and look, gone to the public and asked them about that? Yeah, yeah. And especially what, I guess, four or five years ago now, um, when we were in the process of, of delisting and our state management plan, uh, putting that together, we took that out to the public. We we worked pretty closely. We had a lot of working groups and, you know, town hall listening sessions and, and things like that, where we broke out groups and we talked to people about where you want and don't want grizzly bears. I don't know that we're ever going to get to the point where we have, you know, this firewall, this hard line where we do not uh, tolerate bears in this spot because that's, I don't know how you'd even do it and it would provide it would be a, a huge job in order to to make that happen but um you know the demographic monitoring areas is kind of that line i guess is for as what we consider uh the most suitable habitat and bears outside that line are not necessarily you know they're not caught and killed or anything like that but bears that get in trouble in those places probably aren't going to have as many opportunities as bears within that line and so um it's that kind of thing but you know if you go out to the public in wyoming it depends on where you where you're at you know if you're in cody you're going to get a different answer than you when you're in jackson and so um you know it's it's a wide range of course i'm sure you have the same there <laughs> and there yeah. there was, was a, a loaded, an was element a of, question Dan. yeah <laughs> it was an element of uh, social acceptability in that, as Dan mentioned, in that DMA boundary, mm -hmm. the Wyoming is okay. an example because the Wyoming ranges could be good bear habitat, but there's a hundred thousand sheep that graze in the Wyoming range, and the state, you know, managers decided that you know that they wanted to keep that out of uh, the main grizzly bear area, yeah. and they also you know they don't want bears in the Bighorn Mountains down there, you know that's another one that was socially ex unacceptable. Um, Whether, yeah. Montana also had a, 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 a survey that was done last year. So the state, has, state of Montana has a recent information from the, its population of where bears are 
where they want bears and where they don't. I don't remember the specifics of that, but um, you can get a copy of it from Cecily Costello. Mm -hmm. We actually conducted one of those during our first iteration of delisting back in 2004 or five or whatever it was and um, a public survey that was sent out. And, and it was actually surprising even by area, there was you know over 50%, it was 60 to 70% support for grizzly bear recovery and occupancy in pretty much all the areas in the GYE. So uh, I think overall grizzly bears are, are fairly well accepted, tolerated in most of the areas. It's just when we, we start to see that expansion into these places where it's just, you know, people would not ever consider that they were going to have to deal with grizzly bears 20 years ago, and now they've got them walking through their barnyards and pastures and things. So it gets some folks excited, of course. Thank you, guys. I saw there was a Tom had a question in there about uh, the three by three grid. Um, we chose that size based on uh, male daily activity radius um, from some work that Chuck Schwartz and others did in 2010. And it was, it was kind of a grid size. You know, I, I believe Cecily and Lori used seven kilometer grids for the NCDE. Uh, if if you've got the data, the smaller the grid just ensures that you don't overestimate too much. And so, um, but if your data sources are are not as rich as ours, maybe having that larger grid size is, is potentially better and, and avoids creating a bunch of holes that probably don't exist within the range. And then for the rate of a female expansion kilometers per year, I don't have that off the top of my head, but we could get it. We have all the actual areas, estimated areas for females. And so um, I could get that to you if you need, Tom. Yeah, the males was about 4,000 square kilometers per year. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. There's another question for Dave, and we're just about out of time here, but is there a citation or a paper that shows the expansion that you guys um, demonstrated in this excellent presentation? It's in our annual report. And the most recent annual report just went live on our website, which has been undergoing transformation. So it's a little bit hard to find, but I, I can uh, I can send that to you, a link to that annual report. And we can post that. Yeah. Yep. And, and there actually is on the study team website. Frank just sent out yesterday uh, links to the shape files that have the uh, 2020 estimated range, and then also a link to the uh, animated GIF file that shows the expansion from 1990 to 2020. And those can be downloaded by anybody in the public that wants them. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for this superb presentation. Lots of really good information. And if you wanna Google IGBST, annual reports, you can get to those data that were presented here and a lot more. And uh, it's a, a huge data set and a tremendous uh, publication record that these guys have. So we want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And uh, remember, this will be posted on our, our uh, North American Bears Expert Team YouTube site where we will, we've recorded this and you can watch it again or refer it to other people who may not have seen it. And that'll be up here shortly. So with that, we thank everybody for being here and uh, attending. And um, this will be an IBN a brief article that'll be uh, published next spring as well. So lots of good stuff here. We thank everybody for tuning in. And, and we really thank Dan and Mark for this great presentation. Superb. It's a, you guys set a high bar. Thanks, Chris.